Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Sanjita Saxena and I'm the director of the Jodhari Center for Bangladesh Studies and the executive director of the Institute for South Asia Studies where the center is housed. We continue to live in very challenging times, but the Jodhari Center is committed now more than ever to bringing cutting edge scholarship about Bangladesh by leading experts in the field. Today, I am very privileged to welcome Dr. Mirza Hassan from the BRAC Institute for Governance and Development and Dr. Naomi Hossein from, the American, from American University. They both co-led the State of Governance study. The report which they will discuss today is a flagship publication of BIGD and this year's report assessed the COVID-19 governance in Bangladesh during the first year of the pandemic analyzing how the government responded to the crisis and why, identifying the challenges, and based on the analysis, providing constructive recommendations at policy and programmatic levels. The report identified gaps in critical governance areas, including healthcare, social protection, stimulus packages, and lockdown management, and explored these issues from a political economy angle. Very briefly about how today's event will progress, I will first welcome both researchers to the virtual stage to present the key findings of their report. Then I will introduce both of our discussants. We are very pleased to have today with us Professor Shelley Feldman and Professor Nafisa Tanjim. The discussants will share their thoughts on the report and then we will have a conversation amongst all of us we will then open up the event to questions from all of you. Please do put your questions in the Q&A box. Detailed bios of all the speakers today will be available in the chat function. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Naomi Hossein, Senior Research Professor at the Accountability Research Center at the School of International Service at American University, and Dr. Mirza Hassan, political economist and the head of the governance and politics cluster of BIGD at Brack University. Please, please join me on the virtual stage. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, not quite sure what's going on in my video. It's decided it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it was working a minute ago, so I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sanchita and uh, the, the Chaudhary Centre for, um, for inviting us to do this. Um, we're very pleased to, to share um, our results um, and uh, to discuss uh, with this uh, audience and particularly with uh, Professor Feldman and uh, Professor uh, Nafisa, the findings that we have um, arrived at. Uh, the State of Governance Report, I should just say, first of all, is an annual, well, it's, it's, it's probably more accurately every two years, but um, it's a, a monitoring kind of report of the, the, the conditions of governance and politics in Bangladesh, and uh, Dr. Hassan and I have been working on it together off and on since 2006, when we did the first one of these reports, um, shortly before the extended caretaker government period. Um, which we do not claim to be causal. Um, so we will talk, um, uh, hopefully not too long, but to try and give you a flavor of the findings of our report. We had a really fantastic research team, really quite stunning uh, re researchers and brilliant work, including by Professor Osmani, um, by Dr. Shahad Zaman, the, the, the noted author and doctor and um, you know, very popular writer um, and a wonderful team. And um, uh, sorry, somebody keeps asking me to put my video on, but there's something has gone wrong with it and it's not allowing me to, I'm afraid. I'm not quite sure what, what the issue is, but it won't allow me to. Uh, so I will have to proceed without. Uh, apologies for that. This is the team. I just wanted to make sure you knew how many of us there were. It, the, each of them has contributed to a, a chapter or more than one chapter and uh, um, you know, they all deserve to be credited. The outline of the pre presenta presentation today is I'm going to briefly touch on the issue of why the governance of COVID is so important. Um, and then uh, we're going to shift to a slightly more conceptual discussion about 
the political economy of the pandemic in Bangladesh. Um, uh, Mr. Pai, you'll be taking that on. We'll take you through some of our findings about how the health sector was governed, how the lockdown and uh, 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 economic stimulus packages, including the relief program for people affected by the lockdown and by COVID uh, job losses um, and so on uh, were managed. We'll talk also about the impacts on the RNG sector. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what we, what what implications and what recommendations we drew out of this research. Um, and let me just start then with a, a brief discussion of why this all matters. Um, COVID-19, as we know, is, is a health crisis, but it's not just a health crisis, it's a crisis of social, economic, and political institutions all around the world. And for Bangladesh in particular, I think it's really critical to reflect on the fact that this, this crisis has, has risk, risks and dangers Bangladesh's development achievements, a lot of which are to do with human capital, um, to do with, sorry, human development, um, uh, infant mortality rates and high education rates and, and so on, um, or high enrollment rates. And the, the COVID crisis has really threatened that, those achievements. We've seen all around the world that governance and politics have shaped the national responses to COVID. Um, and it's, 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 not, it's not entirely clear exactly how. Uh, for instance, there was a discussion early in the pandemic a year and a half ago or so that said that authoritarian countries were doing better than democracies, but that, that, that proved not to be the case. Um, it may be that um, there are other factors that intervene, but in any case that the overall politics and governance definitely does shape how governments and countries have responded, but it's not it's not clear that it's in one single uh, direction. And we think that it's, 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 it's very clearly the case that a stronger uh, set of governance arrangements would help Bangladesh protect its citizen, citizens and mitigate against the economic effects of the crisis that came with COVID. Um, and so it was in that spirit that we undertook this research. Um, and now, uh, Mirzabai, would you like to take on the... Yes, this? sure. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, uh, in understanding the political economy of uh, this pandemic uh, governance, uh, we emphasized, focused on the, the, the aspect of state capacity and political capacity. And we thought, you know, this is one of the two most important political economy variables, factors that had a, had a huge impact the way states worked. Um, um, but uh, a little bit of background. I mean, Bangladesh at this stage of uh, at this stage of, of its political evolution, it, it uh, has reached a, what you call a dominant party state, where one one political party calls the shot, and the power is very uh, concentrated uh, um, at the, the prime minister's level, and um, um, the country has been governed. Uh, for some time uh, without any forms of electoral accountability. But before that, we had some degree of electoral accountability, but that can be qualified. And I don't want to get into that. And the most importantly, um, uh, uh, the instead of uh, democratic legitimacy, what we see in Bangladesh, the, which explains uh, what state does, is uh, the performance legitimacy. Um, it's been um, there for some time. Uh, for decades in the absence of uh, robust form of electoral legitimacy. Um, and uh, also another very important uh, um, characteristic of Bangladesh uh, governance that uh, the state is quite weak vis-a-vis -vis strong society, meaning the societal actors. And, and, and it's being manifested in, in various ways. Next, uh, please. So the dominant party state essentially means that, you know, we don't have uh, electoral accountability at the state. Um, and since 2009, um, with, with the, with the, uh, uh, the, when the caretaker government was abolished uh, and we got back the, the electoral dominance system under political party. Um, and and uh, uh, incentives and implications of having a dominant party state that you know you need to satisfy party support much much more than the citizens that you govern immediately. And then you know 
uh, the centralization uh, policy making apparatus are controlled more or less by the political party. Uh, civil service is increasingly politicized. And um, uh, we have called it the party of essentially where a political party controls the state, civil society, and so on. And this uh, civic space has increasingly be, be, uh, have become restricted. Um, and we saw it during the COVID also, where independent experts who became very important, the health experts, but um, uh, they were excluded. They were nominally taken in, a, in, in a, some form of you know, um, uh, committee um, by, as advisors, but you know, they were increasingly marginalized and so on. And so it's just all the civic groups. Um, there were uh, increasing uh, restrictions, restrictions on media and free speech during the COVID time. And um, state obviously had limited capacities and also incentives to collaborate with organized civil society. Um, performance legacy, legitimacy, I uh, talked about it a little bit earlier. So what we have is this uh, state, um, state believe that they can derive their legitimacy or political elites uh, believe that they can derive their legitimacy uh, through performance, development to performance, GDP growth rate, and so on, not stop uh, having any famine or you know, any food crisis and so on. Uh, and, and liberal democratic legitimacy is the least of concern for the political elites. So prioritizing uh, prior livelihoods and subsistence, local economic performance, high growth narrative, um, national and international economic performance, reputation building, and so on, to attract foreign investment and so on. And uh, we have seen particularly this particular uh, incentive for growth narrative led to a, a stimulus package that was almost blatantly biased towards growth orientation with a relative neglect of social and public and protection oriented policy. So we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later. Next one, please. Uh, next, okay. So I, I, I talked about that weak state, state and strong society. Um, state has, uh, in terms of uh, capacity, has you know, uh, a high degree of reach in the infrastructural policy. So the bureaucracy is down there at, at every corner of the country. Um, so that's there, but it has uneven enforcement power. And that's uh, because of increasing capture of the central state by economic elites. So it has lost a lot of you know, uh, autonomy in terms of deciding you know, what kind of economic policies and so on, and, and, and the regulations of the, of, the, of the economic elites. And there is the growing power of the local political machine. By that, I, I mean, um, the, the, the local political elites, the local political party at the, at the, uh, at the sub-district level, at the, at the rural level, they are growing clout. And that is a huge implication as we discuss later on the, on, on the nature of really this distribution. Next one, please. Um, uh, so we, we conducted citizen perception survey in January, 2021 to see, you know, how citizens, uh, uh, perceive the state is performing in terms of you know, COVID management particularly, but also in general. Overall, we found the trust is steady um, in, in terms of you know, government development of performance, which is connected to leg performance legitimacy. So that confirmed that performance legitimacy of this regime uh, has been high, has been high for quite some time. And uh, uh, particularly uh, in terms of in you know, broader management of the COVID. Two, um, uh, majority of people uh, say that, but there are less consensus or mixed opinion uh, about you know the measure level uh, 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 governance in terms of you know public health messaging. Uh, they got higher score, but in testing, uh, in lockdown and relief management, the opinions were very mixed. Next one, please. Um, so um, in, in, to say, in terms of health sector governance, uh, in general, it lacked a policy framework and, 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 and a robust infrastructure for, to respond to such crises like the COVID pandemic. Health system is grossly under-resourced. Public health messaging was effective, as we found out, 
but people had low trust in, in the COVID-19 statistics, you know, uh, statistics related to death and infection, people didn't trust it. Um, pandemic preparation was very centralized. It had to be centralized. The government tried with the decentralized uh, institutions, but didn't work. They had to uh, take over the central, meaning not the central uh, ministry. I'm talking about the prime minister's office to, uh, to control over the health government, health management, and so on. And we found the whole system uh, uncoordinated, non-transparent, public procurements, especially you know, uh, in terms of emergency procurement of health and other you know, uh, stuff, uh, was slow, and it was allegedly corrupt. Um, so what, well, well, I mean, uh, we wonder whether, given the crisis, there will be some kind of you know, changes in the commitment, political commitment in terms of you know, making health governance better. We'll see. We'll have to wait and see for that. Uh, next one, please. Health sector governance, uh, these are the comparative figure uh, of South Asia. You can see in terms of testing, Bangladesh scored very good. Um, okay, next one, please. Um, governance of lockdown. Uh, people were uh, afraid of virus, obviously, and uh, they, they welcomed uh, the lockdown in, in early 2020 when it started. Um, and but uh, you know there were problems with the communication. It was very confusing, inconsistent, uh, uh, and, and that created a lot of problems. That created a uh, lack of trust on the public authority. Um, but most importantly, um, uh, there was this strong public concern that lockdown could be viable, it will work if people uh, receive relief. So that was the idea of the system that in return they will get relief and they don't have to go out to work. And we are talking about you know vast number of poor people. I mean, the people surviving on in, in whatever they get every day, uh, the earning income. And um, uh, knowing that um, the, the the political elite knew that uh, that 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 uh, people um, uh, are not uh, happy with the lockdown enforcement, given that. Um, the relief was not given, or the social protection was, uh, was, was not enough. So, and people needed me. So, the enforcement was done very light by the enforcement authority. And in 2021, um, uh, uh, we found out through a survey that you know, government uh, uh, has learned something, although a slow learner, but they had learned something. So, the lockdown was more coherent. and. Um, uh, government is not more responsive in terms of I mean, what people, what people need, and so on. And, and the result was that you know lockdown became very uh, shortly and it was very relaxed, and so on. Now at this stage, Bangladesh, can't, I don't think Bangladesh will have any lockdown at all. Um, so, all right. Um, so relief program, as I said, there were a lot of uh, 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 negative perception about that. The government initially tried, in fact, they sincerely tried to make relief delivery more accountable, more efficient, more responsive to the poor citizens. Uh, a lot of you know improvisation were done. A lot of institutions were created, hotlines and so on, uh, different kinds of committee to take on each other and so on. Um, but information was very limited to the government. I mean, who deserve and who 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 don't uh, deserve uh, relief? A government didn't have much information on that. They tried to some kind of digital listing and so on, but that didn't work because of the governance issue. Um, and then um, uh, the selection process, the delivery process were opaque and uh, unaccountable. Uh, digital complaints and communication measures uh, at the end of the day proved very ineffective against the, the political economy constraints, you know, the, the, uh, the local. Uh, Machine politics took over. The local political elites took over, and the, bureauc the bureaucrats who were in charge in the beginning, um, uh, they just you know uh, disappeared. Um, um, stimulus package, um, uh, following the logic of uh, performance legitimacy, focused heavily on on the on, on the growth-oriented sectors, spending on social protection. 
uh, was lower and slower. Emphasis within growth sectors on large scale business was given and spending on smaller enterprises uh, lower and slower. And you can see the huge difference between the projection oriented and the growth oriented stimulus package and stimulus in relation to intervention. And it's one of the chapter discussed this, discusses this you know, intensively, rigorously. Um, governance of really program was perceived uh, also as you know, uh, corrupt uh, by the majority of the population. Um, interestingly, NGOs were seen being providing help their presence by only 12% of the people. I mean, a country famous for its NGOs in terms of social protection and this kind of thing. But this is a bit of a shocking that they couldn't do. And there are reasons for it, why, why they couldn't do it. Um, next one, please. RNG sector, um, uh, it, as, as we all know, Bangladesh is heavily dependent on the RNG sector. There's over dependence. Uh, um, and uh, during this COVID, uh, many things uh, were revealed, very unpleasant, negative uh, things. And one of those was that, you know, at the end of the day, workers were treated as disposable. Uh, uh, disposable and uh, by both by the international brands and local owners. Um, and uh, factory owners uh, mostly benefit from the, the stimulus package that was given, in theory, which was supposed to go to the workers as wages. But uh, uh, following the same logic of you know, performance legitimacy, when growth narrative was emphasized, they have to make sure that, you know, that the factory owners are not suffering economically. Their losses were, uh, to cover the losses were the prime uh, interest of the state. Next, please. Um, directives and public health provisions for RMG workers were unclear, inadequate, or unenforced. A lot of, lot of lack of transparency in terms of, you know, uh, the, the government promises that there will be health protocols in, in, in the factory. And uh, one of the reason is that, a very important reason is that, is that workers are um, lack of voice in organizational sense, trade union was very marginal. And so on that, and so that, you know, that, that's why workers got this raw deal at the end of the day. Next one, please. Okay, uh, I hand over to uh, Naomi. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hai. Um, and so we, we, we arrived at certain conclusions and also some recommendations from this research, from these uh, various inputs into the report. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we recognize that the recommendations that we arrived at are um, somewhat thin uh, in that uh, it's not clear that we could suggest anything more ambitious or that anyone would be uh, able or willing to uh, adopt those recommendations. So we'd be very interested to hear from this group um, what they think about our recommendations as well. And um, the first thing that we, we concluded from this uh, research, from this report was that uh, Bangladesh really does need to uh, move beyond a position where it can bounce back from crises, what it really, really needs. And uh, is, is something that we, we concluded after looking across the board at the different sectors, what it really needs is the kind of institutions that get stronger when they are tested by crises like pandemics. Um, and our view about this is that Bangladesh uh, has a very strong track record in disaster management, and this really should be could inform its broader policy response. Um, if they just, if we just keep trying to cope with, you know, to to, to troubleshoot, to firefight crises as they come along, this is this really is a, a serious risk to um, Bangladesh's human development gains. Oh, sorry, um, and we think that, that that it is possible to bring to build anti fragile institutions. We think they need to be decentered and not centralized like they are in Bangladesh currently. They need to be learning organizations and they need to be pluralist organizations that uh, build on Bangladesh's uh, strong heritage of uh, um, plural forms of, of public action. It's very clear that political dominance has had a number of implications for pandemic management. Not all of them are bad, not all of them are bad, that's for sure. But they have had implications for how COVID has been managed. Um, it's, it's clear that, you know, the government has been in some ways released from electoral pressures, 
to 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 take up the kinds of pandemic policies that they they feel are able and that they are able to implement and that are important to implement. But nevertheless, they they are under a lot of pressure to uh, to demonstrate that they are performing, that they are maintaining a high growth rate, that people are not getting better, worse off, but also, of course, that people are not dying in large numbers from COVID. Um, the political dominance has meant that it's actually been quite hard to have these debates in Bangladesh during the pandemic. It's been hard to, um, to, to scrutinize, for instance, uh, public procurement over COVID. Uh, we saw, uh, for instance, um, very prominent journalists like Rosina Akbar, um, see see the inside of a jail cell for reporting on corruption in the procurement process, which of course has a very strong chill factor on everyone else who is trying to, like ourselves, who is trying to um, highlight what the issues are with the, the, the governance and politics of COVID. It, at the same time, you know, it, at the end of the day, the strong society and the weak state um, framework remains relevant here. We see that what really is so important to the government here is broad societal acceptance to the overall policy direction. This, this was crucial. This came up very clearly during the lockdown. These debates about the trade-offs between lives and livelihoods meant that whatever they decided to do, it had to go with the grain of what the population wanted because people will not adhere, will not comply with rules that they, they do not feel are necessary or useful. Our recommendations uh, for Bangladesh are um, are mostly about how to how to govern better um, during a pandemic. And the first thing we would say is that we have a number of strengths in Bangladesh public policy, and we should use them. We should build on them. The first is to leverage our social capital assets. We've got these enormous uh, traditions, enormous organisations, but also long traditions of state society partnerships, which have been very creative, innovative, effective, um, and uh, we need to really introduce those far more centrally into responses like the pandemic response than they were. Uh, essentially, civil society and non-state actors have been more or less excluded from policy processes and implementation. I think government needs to recognize that scrutiny and criticism will only help them improve their performance. They will not reduce their performance legit legitimacy, they will ultimately increase it. They must have, uh, uh, there must be space for relevant civic groups and experts to participate in policy, to, to scrutinize, to critique where necessary. These are essential um, strengths that we've always had and we should bring those uh, to bear on the pandemic situation. Similarly, we have very good disaster management capacities. We have reasonably effective social protection um, programs compared to many other countries at higher level of development. So we think that this is an opportunity to realize a very bold vision of social protection for all, um, because COVID does risk undoing many, many decades of, of progress. Um, and it, it is, it's really key, I think, that, um, that, that corruption and social protection gets a real um, focus here, much more transparency and accountability. People need to be able to complain when they're not getting the services that they, they need that they are relying on to survive during a crisis like this. And those, those grievance redress mechanisms, those accountability mechanisms are just so weak in Bangladesh currently. Um, we think there are obviously plenty of gaps here that need plugging, and I don't need to tell anyone here what those are. Um, you know, in the short term, it's vaccines, it's testing and containment. In the medium term, it's, it's creating a health system that is much more accountable to policies. It is thinking about crisis responses, economic stimulus, as being about people, about protecting citizens, not about boosting GDP growth. Um, and there has to be a great deal more accountability over procurement um, and uh, uh, regulation and so on of the health sector. I've already said a bit about this. We think that the government can do more to build anti-fragile institutions. Um, and, and these are very generic sorts of recommendations. Nevertheless, they're very relevant in this case. Decentralization is clearly a crucial issue for um, effective health policies. Citizens need to be able to participate in policy making at different levels, including feedback. Um, and state actors need to be able to adapt their behavior um, in light of new information in, under conditions of great uncertainty. Um, and I think we're going to leave it there, Sanjita, um, over to you.
Thank you so much uh, both for the excellent presentation. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Nafisa Tanjim, Assistant Professor of Gender, Race and Sexuality Studies and Global Studies at Lesley University to share some of her thoughts. Sure. Um, thanks, everyone. So uh, this report on governing COVID-19 in Bangladesh, Realities and Reflections to Build Forward Better, is a thoughtful reflection on the governance in Bangladesh during the first year of the pandemic and a critical assessment of the government's response. The report identifies crucial governance challenges and provides recommendations based on secondary sources as well as primary research and ethnographic observations. One of the major things I would argue the report brings forward is this ironic and to some extent problematic life versus livelihood challenge that the COVID-19 posed for policymakers. Um, I argued elsewhere drawing on Michelle Murphy's analysis of the economization of life that the global COVID-19 pandemic created an abandoned ground for viewing human population in an economic container. Countries in both the global north and the south pursued cost-benefit analysis of continuing lockdown versus reopening the economy. And first of all, if the need for choosing between life versus livelihood emerges in the society, we probably should not just focus on finding that answer, and we should probably prioritize asking why the binary between life versus livelihood exists in the first place. There's a problem with trying to choose between life and livelihood, because while we do it, we develop a governance mechanism that arbitrarily chooses which lives are worth living and worth saving, relying on market rationals. The lives of less important and disposable people become expendable to feed the national dream of a burgeoning economy. And I think the BIGD study aspires to address this concern by proposing a call to go beyond the desire, become resilient and aim for anti-fragility, which acts for, uh, quote, moving away from highly centralized decision making to constructing de decentralized public entities that are empowered, efficient, resource, and motivated to in innovate, experiment, and engage with citizens. One of the things the report does um, a very good job of addressing is this paradox in Bangladesh where the ruling Aumilik party has been holding power for years after years and electoral competition does not necessarily provide any incentive for prioritizing concerns of the mass who are not rich and powerful. Um, it's interesting that citizens trust um, remain, um, in, in the government's overall performance remains steady. And using the phrase um, performance legitimacy, the report problematizes the way the government tried or showed that it tried to establish its legitimacy through COVID-19 management performance, and it unravels the loopholes and disjunctures of these processes. In a country where democratic accountability is gradually disappearing and critical and dissident voices are being criminalized, citizens' trust in governance overall performance has been manufactured by various neoliberal tools of governmentality, which might be a fascinating future project for BIGD. We see the manifestation of performance legitimacy and manufacturing constant in the health sector and lockdown measures as reported by the study. The report does a very good job of demonstrating that the government took a series of lockdown measures to legitimize its existence and operation, but often those directives were taken without democratic participation of various decision-making bodies and common population. As the report mentions, the National Committee for Prevention and Control of COVID-19 met only three times during the peak transmission from March till July and major decisions such as factory opening was made in collaboration with BGMEA, BKMEA, uh, FBCCI, and other business representatives as reported by Delister on April 22nd, 2020. And the National Committee for Prevention and, COVID uh, Pre Prevention and Control of COVID-19 was not necessarily a part of the conversation. Uh, the report touched upon the general holiday provision, which was, by the way, evoked to describe the first lockdown in 2020. Um, I talked about elsewhere that the government didn't specify whether the holiday falls under the Communicable Diseases Prevention, Control and Eradication Act 2018 or the Disaster Management Act in 2021. And in India, for example, um, it was evoked, uh, the, uh, India, for example, evoked um, the 
lockdown under the Disaster Management Act, which officially barred factory owners from laying off workers. In Bangladesh, a vague declaration of general holiday with 31 directives from the prime minister, including an even vaguer clause saying industry owners should continue production in consultation with workers while providing health protections. And you can imagine what kind of consultation power workers have while uh, negotiating with the factory owner on a bargaining table. And these directives did not specify what adequate health protection measures should look like. And this created the scope for powerful business owners to effectively use the general holiday provision and the directives to serve their interests and strip workers of their rights and protections granted by the labor law of Bangladesh. The report brings attention to the COVID-19 stimulus package that was growth oriented instead of protection oriented. In a world shaped by neoliberalism and global capitalism, we see similar iterations all over the world. For example, the $2 trillion CARES Act that was passed in the United States in 2020 offered, 50, offered $500 billion to big businesses and large corporations. However, due to pressure from grassroots progressive activist organizers, the bill also, to some extent, it was forced to include significant allocations for small businesses, state and local governments, public services, and most importantly, individuals in forms of extra unemployment payments and benefits. However, in Bangladesh, where we see that, um, as the report also mentions, a series of arrests were made to suppress critical journalists and other people who were critical of the government's COVID-19 response. And it became very difficult to organize against the top-down, pro-growth, pro-big business stimulus package. According to the study conducted by Salim Rahan in 2020, the government announced 19 stimulus packages accounting for about 3.7% of the GDP of the country, but most of the stimulus packages were directed towards big corporations and big businesses. For example, export-oriented industries got 50 billion taka to pay the wage bill for three months. Banks got 300 billion taka to provide working capital loans to affected industries, and 200 billion working capital loan was issued to small and medium businesses. A 50 billion refinance scheme was provided for the agricultural sector. In the R&D sector, only 80% export requirement fulfilling factories qualified for the stimulus loan, which left out about 3,000 smaller factories that produce for the domestic market and pick up subcontracting for direct, from direct exporters. And if we analyze all the schemes, we see that there was, the un, there was this unquestionable faith in the trickle-down theory with the assumption that if big businesses and banks are saved, common people will be saved, which was not necessarily the case as demonstrated by the BIGD report. The stimulus loans did not necessarily save government workers who were still struggling with uncertainties regarding unemployment, unsafe working conditions, and no social protection. Poor and working class people have been left out to fend for themselves. Government relief was there, but it was corrupted by malfunctioning governance, limited the availability of transparent public information, and it was influenced by local political parties as described in the report. And we could not expect NGOs to step in to fill the vacuum created by the lack of public support due to their contingent funding and lack of flexibility in their budget provisions. And of course, pandemic-induced livelihood threats can't be possibly reverted by the reliance on corporate social responsibility funds and individual charity. So I think overall, the report does an excellent job of offering a critique of the reactive stance of the government and our pride in being resilient. It demonstrates the value of anti-fragile governance, and it also documents what worked and what did not work in the public health and the dysfunctional social security system during the pandemic. It also offers a powerful critique of the growth-oriented development model as opposed to social protection-oriented development model. It also offers some creative pathways through which the government can collaborate with NGOs, CSOs, community-based organizations to distribute relief and social support. All the recommended action it proposes were well thought and should be carefully considered and explored. As feminist scholar Ilora Chudhuri evocatively argues, the spread and consequences of the pandemic and relatively capitalism are far more lethal for these with pre-existing conditions. And by pre-existing conditions, she meant the pre-existing economic, social, gender, racialized, class, structural inequities. 
And the BIG report does a good job of offering some creative pathways to creative pathways to think about how we might think of addressing these pre-existing conditions. And lastly, for future research, I think it would be interesting to expand the definition of governance and go beyond public health, lockdown management, pandemic-related economic stimulus and relief program. It would be important to produce demographic data and show breakdowns based on gender, ethnicity, geography, religion, and other identities and social locations. The report briefly mentions an ethnographic study in Kurail. It will be exciting to see further in-depth ethnographic studies and mixed method studies that will be able to produce rich, in-depth, diverse observations and findings regarding the COVID-19 experience of the common mass. Questions of transparency, accountability, corruption, rule of law, and inclusiveness would be worth exploring. Specific studies on how the COVID-19 governance mechanisms affect uh, issues like food justice, education justice, livelihood justice, gender justice, or climate justice might offer new ways to explore sector-specific experience and implications during the pandemic. Um, also, future, future studies on how we can move beyond governance, how we can move governance beyond the state mechanisms and direct it towards emancipating people and building grassroots radical social movements might also offer us new pathways to think about the role of governance, not only during emergency situations, but also towards building a sustainable, inclusive and egalitarian future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nafisa. And now, finally, I'd like to welcome Professor Shelley Feldman, Professor of Development Sociology at Cornell University. Hi, everyone. I want to thank uh, the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to participate in this and to bring me back in touch with uh, colleagues and friends. I, um, I think the report um, is, is extremely well done and extremely polite in the ways in which it's made its recommendations and um, choices about uh, how to say what it says and yet offer a quite critical and abiding critique. Uh, I, uh, following Nafisa's excellent comments, I, I think it's probably worthwhile for me to just use a historical lens instead of repeating some of the excellent points she made. And one of the things I would suggest is if I go back to 1980, 1990, and 2000, and I can move this crisis and change the name of it to floods, the cyclone, Sidr, any of these kinds of things, precisely the same critique would be made and precisely the same recommendations would be made. And so I guess I would love to play out and have the authors sort of uh, further because they've done an excellent job of combining methodological strategies. Some of the interview data is really, really interesting. Um, but play out, for example, isn't there a contradiction between steady trust in the government and recognition of the failure to provide provisions, the inequality in the countryside, the forced reliance on communities themselves to aggregate and make sense of and figure out how to keep rates low, to approve and work and accept the lockdown. I remember seeing images during Eid about the buses being full up and so on. I was terrified, especially since the India debate was, or the India um, statistics was much more available. And it was shocking and delightful to realize how much better Bangladesh did, but how much of it depended on the wherewithal, creative capacity, willingness to work together at the grassroots level. It seems to me this is a, a hidden message in this text. And I think it's important to, to elaborate. How do you, uh, are people sort of arguing that they trust the government because it's an easy response? You know, but, the, but if you unpack that term, what does it mean for the actual individuals who say that? How do they adjudicate for themselves? their frustration, their angst, their anxiety, their worry, their starvation, their lack of resources with this notion of trust. And it reminded me, and I wanna thank both of you in, in your pr presentations today to sort of emphasize the importance of this narrative of growth. I think every villager probably feels that I don't wanna be put down for being rural or being poor or being, I love this narrative of growth, but this narrative of growth doesn't really deliver and they know it. So there's another contradiction between how this narrative 
in a sense, provides a chilling effect on opposition. You know, it itself, the sort of um, symbolic violence that's done by narratives of trust, narratives of uh, belief in growth, uh, narratives of security, narratives of, yes, we are a decentralized country, theoretically, uh, but yet they don't deliver at the de decentralized level. The power is not working with the infrastructural decentralization. And I think the report does a nice job of going back and forth to showcase some of these, um, these kinds of concerns. Uh, it would be interesting, for example, to, to un better understand, uh, and again, what you have is really a marvelous step in this direction, but what specifically do people feel would be improved if they were included in the decision-making process? Yes, the balance, neoliberalism, and we can throw out all those terms, but what's so robust in the report is, is having access to and people willing to talk about what these terms actually mean to both create possibilities for mobilization, but also get responded to with the chilling effect of, you know, shutting down and, uh, well, not shutting down, but uh, arresting the Pratamalu author because they put in rumors on the public press. It seems to me that how communities learned was precisely from these leaks that they knew what to do. I mean, I imagine, and this is only a, an imagination, that people get information from in all sorts of ways and they don't only take it from the centralized government, which is not delivering to them and they know it's not delivering to them. So how did they learn washing hands, you know, um, washing your clothes, making sure you don't allow a lot of commerce and movement in the community? I mean, that was a great example of how people bring to the, to the fore their own knowledge, contra, not contra, that's a, probably a wrong word, but in light of or despite the government's proclamations of what they should do and how they should do it, and then they, it, the you know, things would be delivered. I mean, I think we can go back and forth on the growth versus social provisioning. I mean, I think this has been the case in every sector. Think about coal mining in Bangladesh. It's livelihoods versus security, sustainability, economic security. Uh, you know, environmental security, the Shundabans is being challenged precisely in the same terms, growth versus social provisioning, or in this case, livelihoods and so on. So it seems to me one of the things that would be lovely to think more about is what particularly did the pandemic do and how it re reached people and communities that provided an impetus that, that was national, as opposed to the impetus that would be around the Fulbari or um, Shundab you know, uh, uh, Shundaban's uh, coal scheme. There's a lots of un unrest around those two things, but they're more, they're not quite national, even though they often are brought to Dhaka, but they're not national movements. But this is the, the grist for a national recognition. And it, this is what makes it so distinctive as a crisis, uh, it seems to me, and what we can learn differently. So, you know, teasing apart much more what decentralization would do differently in this kind of situation and in another. I also think it would be interesting to talk a little bit more about the Bangladesh's relations globally. You point out in the report that um, the US gave them a loan. I mean, this sounds, sounded to me really unpleasant as usual, uh, but here's a crisis. You hear in other circumstances that the cost of these vaccines are not cheap and they're being sold to countries in different kinds of ways. Uh, how does the global economy actually impact and how has it impacted on Bangladesh um, in a very specific way? We do know that uh, there a, was a decline in demand for ready-made garments by 85%. So labor was sort of uh, unseated, not only uh, because of local interests, although they are horrible uh, in the ways in which 
elites or factory owners treated their workers or guaranteed some kind of income. But how did the global economy have a direct impact on that in ways that were not addressed either globally or nationally? You know, it was basically a subsidy to, to capital in that way that secured their ability to get online as soon as the crisis was over and people desperate so they, you know, uh, are unable to do that. But it didn't deal with the majority of workers who are in these non-organized factory, in the informal sector. The elites control the big EPZ located often factories. They didn't gain and garner any support uh, for the um, informal workers who are the most um, probably compromised in terms of how they live, where they live, their access to resources, and the $1.90 a day that they sometimes can earn. So uh, there's that part of it. And there's also the rural part about the, organ uh, about the almost ig ignoring of, uh, social, of fiscal support to the countryside, except through the party mechanisms and through some kind of decentralization. So I guess what I sort of like to leave as, for me, is one of the most important uh, questions, it, and it sounds like a simple-minded question, but um, it's how the narrative of growth enables people to feel trust in the economy, despite contradictory evidence that compromises their very health status. And this study, and probably as you mine the data more, uh, might reveal some interesting insights because we live through contradiction. Um, and if we want to think about um, trust or the statement of trust, it reminds me of going into the countryside and asking how much land do you own? Or, you know, are you married? Or these questions that have obvious answers. And it's very difficult to sort of imagine that people would not say they don't trust government, especially in a one party state that's moving closer and closer to authoritarian rule that has no reason to worry when there's no political opposition. I mean, all of that's happening. And yet this word trust carried a lot of weight in the report. And I, I think it almost does a disservice a little bit to, um, I, or the, for the reader, it doesn't give me enough information about what the person means by trust and how trust is constituted um, and how it actually, in, including in the notion of uh, the growth narrative, how in fact symbolic violence in this way is, can be as destructive against things that Nafisa was talking about and Mirza was talking about, about the hope of mobilization and reorganization and so on. The structural, institutional, infrastructural issues are pretty straightforward and they've existed and Bangladesh has had this history of crisis and sort of managing it. But how in fact does trust take on a different uh, sensibility under the current regime? And how do people actually experience, I guess, what trust means on one hand and disdain and frustration for the failure of accountability, the failure of transparency, the failure of access to resources. How do they really navigate that? And that's something that really depends on the rich kind of data that you have in, in this one community, but also maybe you have in other spaces of the, of the data that you are collecting. And I just hope you write that part of it up because I think it would be really, really interesting to show the potential for mobilization may be different. And I guess for many of us, that's an important goal that people keep uh, at least attempt through mobilization to keep the growth strategy and the allocation of resources so disproportionately to the elite, at least under some check if in fact political legitimacy is going to sort of be maintained. Um, and let me end there because I'd like to hear more about <laughs> what, the, what you have in the report. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Shelley, and thank you to both you and Nafisa for your excellent uh, comments and feedback. I know there's a lot of issues that were raised. So um, Naomi, Mirza, I, I open the floor to you to respond. 
Can me, I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, so fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor Velman, Dr. Thanjima. And it's really, it's really interesting to have two quite anthropological, sociological perspectives on this work. We've spoken previously with a lot of political economists and the, the various weights differ so much on what you focus on. And I, I really loved the fact that both of you really talked about these, uh, you, you, you spoke Shelley about the symbolic violence of growth, I think that's very important. And uh, Nafisa, you spoke about the, the disposability and this, this kind of false dichotomy between lives and li livelihoods. And I think these are really critical questions. And Bangladesh is this really critical moment where, you know, we moved from least developed country, you know, the basket case, all the images of poverty and famine and hunger, to really quite rapidly moving into lower middle income status. And actually this disposability of Bangladeshi bodies is no longer fit. You know, it, it was once upon a time, you could talk about millions and thousands of people this way and that way, but it's no longer acceptable in Bangladesh to, to think of any Bangladeshis as disposable. It's not acceptable. And so this is this, this COVID uh, crisis in my, to my mind has really dramatized this lives versus livelihoods, growth versus rights, if you like, um, kind of discourse that we have. And I think it's been very interesting. I'm so glad you mentioned Michelle Murphy's work, Nafisa, because absolutely the economi economization of life in Bangladesh in this particular crisis has been so acute and so and so um, important. And it's very clear that it's importantly shaping the policy mindset, you know, within which all of this is going on. Quickly on trust, um, Shelley, I think the reason we pick this up is that this is, trust has been, um, seen as a really critical variable in all of the politics and governance of COVID studies. You know, if, if people trust their government for whatever, whether they do so for good or bad reasons, whether they do so when they're wrong to do so or right to do so, trust, you know, a sense that your government more or less has your back, more or less is doing the right kind of thing for you, as we know from living in the US, is a really important factor in who will comply with what. And uh, there, you know, Mirza and I will talk more about this, I think, but, you know, we have the same, it's interesting that we, we when we've spoken about this work to anyone, um, academics and, you know, uh, civil society people like yourself, this is the thing that people find most difficult to cope with, I think, too difficult to believe that actually there is quite a high degree of trust in the general population in Bangladesh for for the government in general, not just this specific government, but for the state in general, it's it's it is surprising. You know, cross 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 country research has shown this over and over again, um, and there's there's very good explanations for that. In this particular instance, we like to point out that this survey was done in January 2021, so it was at this moment when a lot of governments, rightly or wrongly, in South Asia, were saying, "Ah, you know what? We've we've kind of we've handled COVID. Look at us. We're so smart." And so there was a sense in which, you know, even on COVID, the government was doing OK. Um, and that we strongly suspect, should we go back to the field now, we would get a very different response. But the overall trust levels in the government as a provider of a degree of stability, a degree of, you know, economic functioning, some slightly, slowly, gradually improving public services, this is definitely there. And it's you know, for, for the, for the, you know, for the intelligentsia and the academic classes, it's, this is hard to, we find this difficult. We, we find it difficult. So I'm not surprised that anyone else does. These are very standard uh, uh, methodologies that we use that I think are important. I'm going to leave it there. I would love to talk more about mobilization and what COVID has meant for that. Um, but I leave it to Mirza Pai for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, these are difficult questions. I mean, <laughs> we have been also pondering about it for some time. And we get this critic all the time that, you know, there must be something wrong with the survey, too. This is one extreme criticism. And then uh, more sympathetic criticism would say that, you know, this is a highly regimented society and, you know, lack of democracy. People are not talking about this. So that's not a very valid criticism in the sense that uh, people, people did criticize. In, in other dimensions, you know, in terms of that government is basically lying with the testing and all the statistics. The people were, you know, uh, very, very candid about those things. So you cannot say that, you know, in some cases people are afraid and some questions people were not afraid. So that's not a valid criticism. But we need, really need to understand. But uh, uh, 
let, let me give you a perspective, total uh, broader perspective on the surveys, because these are, this is not the only survey that we carried out. We did surveys, pre-COVID surveys um, uh, in 2019, and the similar, similar trust, similar legitimacy when it comes to broader governance and so on. Uh, so this is a continuity. This is not a you know, fluke. This is not happened all of a sudden. So there is a broader continuity. And, and my experience, experiences in doing conducting surveys so for the last 20 years, and I've found similar things. Um, uh, and, you know, um, um, but you have to remember that uh, this, is, this is a complex dynamics. If, um, 30 percent, more than 30 percent people uh, didn't agree with this about the trust of giving legitimacy. They didn't. They didn't lend legitimacy. Okay, it's a big chunk of the population in our survey, particularly in the political surveys. The legitimacy is quite low, so pe the people not are not lending legitimacy to a non-democratic government. Okay, so that's there. Um, so and so it's, it's dynamics, it's complex, it's uneven. Um, the perception. So that, but um, in, in general, I think people preferred uh, with this particular, you know, with this regime that there is a general stability, political stability, you know, uh, no hot towels or strikes, as you know, shutdowns, uh, economic security, people could, you know, fend for themselves at least, there is no ma major disruptions, uh, no famine and so on. Um, I remember uh, when General Eshad was in power in the 80s, many people um, the, uh, actually lent legitimacy to that, to that regime on the economic ground, that he made a lot of roads, that he built up infrastructures, okay? So these are very important for people who are poor uh, in terms of, you know, uh, lending legitimacy to a particular regime. Um, uh, so that's there. And, um, and this contradiction that uh, 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 Professor Feldman was trying to point out was flagging uh, that this contradiction between these you know, lived experiences of living in poverty and misery in, you know, uh, in, in the adequate access to health and so on. So these are, these are, these are definitely, and then you know, pr uh, um, uh, providing legitimacy at the macro level, at the meta level to the, to the regime. Um, so th these are something I don't have ready answer for this. Uh, we, we need to think uh, uh, deeply. Um, but as you know, the historical subaltern studies have shown, and many other similar types of studies looking at the subaltern perception in terms of authority and so on, that they tend to find fault. And whatever the reason, lack of in is asymmetric information, lack of information, and so on, critical information going to the grassroots level in a largely non-literate society or semi-literate society. So don't forget it. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, that the problem lies with our local elites, with our local, local political elites. The problem lies with our, you know, the chairman and the members of the unions and so on, not with the prime minister. She meant well. She's providing the resources, but is being eaten up by the intermediaries, the local political elites. So that's the thing, easy to blame. So that kind of, you know, um, perception is there. It's not, I wouldn't say this is in a stupidity. Of course it is not. That's based on, the, you know, their, their uh, uh, again, you know, lived experiences. So and, and also um, what, they, what they see uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what is happening. Um, so th that's something there. Um, also, another, um, in terms of, you know, life versus livelihood, um, government, when people, they, as we said, this, this was conditional in terms of lockdown. So people wanted to support lockdown, strict lockdown, they wanted to observe it, but when they found out that, you know, these social protection measures are really and so on, uh, they, they, they were not forthcoming. So, so uh, they, they uh, uh, this, uh, it, it, it's like a, uh, taking a decision based on sense of resignation also. Uh, it kind of like individual decisions. You have to remember that vast majority of the Bangladeshi poor, urban and rural, are not organized, politically speaking. There is no organized countervailing power of the poor. Bangladesh left politics is extremely weak 
fragmented. And uh, uh, so, so that's there. There is no, so there is no culture of, or trade unions are very weak, similarly. So uh, protesting collectively uh, and bargaining efficiently uh, in terms of, you know, live versus livelihood choices was kind of, you know, was perceived by the majority of the poor as of the agenda. It's not feasible, it's politically not feasible. So at least they wanted, uh, it's, it's a, uh, Naomi is an expert on this area and looking at the history of the social contract and so on. You know, that, that uh, government state is perceived as a benevolent, benevolent patron rather than you know, representative of the people. Again, this is not my speculation, it's coming from the surveys. Um, and they would expect this benevolence uh, that, you know, if you can't feed me, at least allow me to fend for myself. Okay. Uh, and the politician understood it and they went for that. Okay. No more, no more uh, lockdowns, no more restrictions, you know, complete freedom uh, to, to fend for yourself, economic freedom. And one of the uh, important uh, survey finding was that when you ask people, you know, what you need to live in, uh, live with dignity and so on, and other things came, you know, food and so on. But another thing was freedom to move, freedom of movement. And now I understand what that meant. That, you know, during the lockdown, all they wanted, if you can't feed me, let me find my own uh, fend for myself, you know, let me get my own, uh, uh, let me go out and work. don't restrict that. Don't, you know, create, you know, any kind of, you know, obstructions there. So those, those kind of things, I'm, 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 I'm sure, you know, uh, I, I'm not giving a very good convincing interpretation of these findings, so-called contradiction, but, um, uh, but based on the, the empirical findings and, and, and based on the experiences of the poor, the way poor looked at perceived the lockdown measure, um, I think um, th this could be a kind of you know approximate explanation for that. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so Nafisa, Shelley, your responses. Nafisa, did you want to do? Did you want to say something first? Um, not really. I'm, I know it's a work in progress. So um, all the things that you mentioned, and specifically um, um, Dr. Hassan, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think it would be a fantastic study to kind of look at the framing and dive deeper into what makes people actually grow those perceptions. And overall, this free market mentality and this focus on individual responsibility, like how this becomes so popular with a community where people would be like, okay, let me fend for myself if you can provide me with resources. Like where exactly does it come from? And again, I mean, my training is in feminist anthropology. So I'm kind of mostly thinking about, you know, the construction of discourses and what normalizes this idea that, you know, you are not entitled to social protection by the state and if the state cannot so protect social protection and this inherent faith in the goodwill of the prime minister. So it's interesting to think about the way, you know, how people develop this notions of trust in, you know, like top management, like top power, state mechanisms, and then kind of uh, believe in this sense of, you know, like individual liberty to make their livelihood decisions. I think that would be a fantastic thing um, to kind of move forward. And again, I mean, the, the data you have is fascinating. And I guess maybe, I don't know, I mean, you can think of doing a second series of it. Like, okay, I mean, you focus on the first year of pandemic and then what exactly the second year looked like. And in your report, you argued that the government took some lessons and we did see some places where they improved, although there were limitations. So maybe it would be a fantastic thing to kind of think about, okay, how exactly it went in the second year. And so it sounds like, you know, pandemic, it, it's probably gonna be an ongoing issue specifically because of, of the vaccination rate that we have right now and with the rise of new variants. So um, yeah, a study like this one for the second year of pandemic can offer some really um, critical avenues to think about what to do next when, you know, we 
probably will be in this crisis for a few more years to kind of think about you know what the next steps should be. But overall, fascinating study. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nafisa. That's a really good suggestion. We, I think we we very had good. a similar notion, and I think that's very encouraging. And I'll second that, I suppose. But also, um, despite the, this claim about individualism and a return to just my personal self having opportunities for livelihood, look at the collective action at the local level that set up and enforced in some way um, the lockdown, cleaning, uh, keeping other people out. I mean, these are the things that are so interesting, these sparks of opposition to that without a claim of opposition, just doing it. And I think for me, that's happening more in Bangladesh than it happens in the US, you know, as an example, that the neoliberal individual subject is very differently positioned in Bangladesh than it is here. And what can we learn from that positioning? Is it the experience of other crises that gave me the wherewithal to know that we have to stick together? Because under those crises, it was other villagers who helped each other. Despite enmities before, those are the people who went out. We learned that from reading about other disasters. This, you have this wonderful evidence to make this you know, uh, more real and palpable and argue for that kind of space to think with those kinds of idioms and what that gives us as a lens for understanding the social dynamics of Bangladeshi civil society, if you will, broadly. But I'm going to go back to this question of trust. I mean, you know, as political scientists, you may operationalize this term, and it may mean these specific things. I'm not sure it means the same thing to villagers. I think it's a term of security, of not, of not being anti-government in a situation where political legitimacy is honored. It's a new normal, you know, as we say now. It's a totally new normal, and you say things because basically because no one's beating you up right then you trust them you know un until the situation you know could get worse so i still would love to know more about the constructedness of that word trust and the interpretive or the experiential notion of trust which is what's so rich potentially rich in your evidence so i agree about trust cal calculations but I don't think that's what I was talking about. I was talking about how people live the experience of believing in government. I mean, I have friends and colleagues in Bangladesh who say, you know, authoritarianism is not so bad, at least we're managing, you know, and then their friend gets arrested and, uh, you know, and then there's a, a fear and threat that so, such, such and such a speaker can't speak here because, you know, if she does, you know, there'll be a you and cry and the PM can get directly involved in that kind of situation. How do we understand that experience and what it means for maybe even criticizing some of these trust studies that um, I think are, norm are being normalized around an idiom of bad word autocratization or autocratizing regimes, taking away more and more liberties at the same time as giving you individual freedom to work. I mean, isn't that a contestation that's worth thinking about? Individual freedom to work, but not to feel differently about and make demands on and mobilize. Mobilization in Bangladesh has been clamped down for a long time. And it's, I, in my view, it's been increasing around public mobilizations prior to the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. What does the pandemic do for that? I'm really curious to know if it increased opportunities for collective action because people are working together to secure their own everyday lives under horrible conditions, or is it, you know, denigrating that possibility under the guise of certain kinds of threats, potential threats, narratives of, or it's the chill, as you use in the, in the report, the chilling effect of some of these narratives. So. Thank you again. It, it's a really rich, lovely document to, to have the pleasure of reading. Shelley, we will take up those questions of trust more seriously. I, I do think you're right, yeah. I'm going to keep on your case because <laughs> I think it's really important. Thanks. Uh, Mirza, did you want to respond? Do you, do um, you... um, uh, not directly.
but uh, I mean, uh, I agree. Um, uh, we looked at the look at the you know uh, numerous protests that uh, took place um, uh, in the urban area mostly, um, and uh, we looked at the, the demands of the protest uh, uh, by the urban workers, transport workers, and the garage hawkers, vendors, and so on, who are badly affected, the, slot, the, the people who live in the uh, informal settlements, the low-income informal settlements. Uh, and, uh, and, and the overwhelming majority of the demand of, of those protests were, allow us to work, mm -hmm. allow us to drive the bus. That's it. Nothing about social protection, nothing about entitlement from the state, and so on. And uh, th this is fascinating. And at the same time, people believe that, you know, a state as a benevolent patron who, who is supposed to feed us in our crisis. But it's, it's, it doesn't translate into an entitlement rights, those kind of things, like clients uh, uh, expecting uh, support, protection from the patrons. So it is patron clientelism. It's, 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 is a very cliche word I know, but it works. It, it helps to understand a lot of things. Um, so that's there. And the, and, and the one thing that we need to understand also, and the prime ministers and the overwhelming majority of Bangladeshi, they are into positive liberty rather than negative liberty. Okay, about you know uh, all those uh, uh, resources uh, and so on. Um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, that that um, uh, economic needs and, and and so on over over those uh, negative liberties, libertarian thing like human rights or voting rights or democracy as understood in a narrow way, procedural democracy and so on. So those kind of meta um, uh, meta discourses and 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 uh, not discourses actually these are the real real world. Uh, dynamics uh, th that that uh, uh, people when people make decisions uh, those contradictions that Professor Feldman was talking about uh, th th those are embedded there embedded in that kind of you know large uh, ideology and and not only ideology I mean when people believe in uh, uh, give preferences to positive liberty over negative liberty that's part of their real life. It's not a it's not a discourse as such in that sense. Mm -hmm. So we need to take care of those and understand the, the difficult question that you guys are posing. Uh, we need to bring in those those issues and you know how those meta variables, meta factors uh, explain the, the the agency, whether individual or collective. So I'll stop here. And then Fisa, did you want to respond? Yeah, I just wanted to be um, quick, and I think the whole this whole discussion <clears throat> that we are having here might benefit from two sets of literature. First of all, um, there has been a lot of um, thinking and writing about the nonprofit industrial complex, um, and also in 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 the global south and countries like Bangladesh. I think there are tremendous possibilities to think about the symbiotic relationship in the, between the state and nonprofit organizations, regional, local, international nonprofit organizations, and how the funding politics basically, in some cases, takes energy away from independent social organizing mm -hmm. and kind of inspires nonprofit organizations um, to provide services or, I mean, the kind of work that you were doing, right? It's super important, it's advocacy, it's criticism of the government, but by law, uh, if you're registered as a nonprofit organization, you can't necessarily go to the street and you know, like do anything that violates the, the law or do engage in any kind of civil disobedience. And also there's this literature on um, mutual aid and this whole idea about you know, like solidarity, not charity. So I think some of the things that we're talking about, like individual collective organizing, I mean, it might benefit from, um, from, from, from the mutual aid literature and think about whether we are actually politicizing the things that we are doing like when collectives like trade unions or you know like workers groups they're organizing and demanding the right to work like how much politicizing is going on there locally um regionally and whether there are efforts to understand that okay just the right to work is not necessarily going to be enough and at one point we need to question you know why we don't necessarily have a, a 
an effective social protection system. And my work involves a garment workers organizing, and I have been kind of documenting some of the organizing initiatives, many um, small grassroots uh, collectives have been doing during the pandemic. And while they're organizing for the immediate needs, um, I have seen you know, some initiatives where they're kind of trying to ask the more fundamental questions, um, trying to collaborate with local and global scholars and activists. So it might be beneficial to kind of think about like whether and how politicizing um, the movement at the grassroots level specifically, you know, within small groups have been going in Bangladesh. So we have a couple more minutes left um, and I wanted to just take some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Um, and if anyone else would like to submit their questions, please do submit it through the Q&A box. Um, so the first question is from Chris Raymond. He asks, what was the, uh, sorry, was the lack of social dialogue or consultation with unions, particularly in the RMG sector, simply a continuation of existing industrial relations policy? Yes. Naomi, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, Sanjeev, yes. Yes. I have the same answer, actually. I wrote oh. it down. <laughs> and Sanjeev, yes, uh, you're, you're the one who knows better. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. More of the same. I mean, what did the pandemic do but dramatize and, um, you know, in some ways spotlight the existing inequalities of power, the existing weaknesses of independent mobilization and independent trade unions? I think the you know, more than ever, even, you know, ever, since Rana Plaza, this was the moment when the, the, the dispo essential disposability of garment workers um, was highlighted, I think, and, and the disposability not just to the Bangladeshi factory owners, but really to the, uh, the, the, the global industry. So, yes. Uh, the second question is from uh, Naima Kayum. Really like the concept concept of anti-fragile institutions. Could you share a bit more about how we might envision these? Is it okay? Well, I think it's in, it's in the recommendation section. It was, uh, I mean, we, we tried to uh, come up with uh, concrete, um, uh, concrete uh, suggestions and what would be the manifestation of this, you know, of these anti-fragile institutions and what what needed to be done. So you know, decentralization, of course, in the, and uh, greater um, synergy between the local community and the local administration. Uh, genuine synergy, not mediated by some kind of bureaucratic process and so on, is helpful. It has instrumental value to get the best um, information from the people. Um, and also uh, 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 other substantive um, uh, achievements in terms of, you know, uh, uh, increasing the sense of ownership of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of thing. What happened, uh, one example would be, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long discussion, I cannot get into this. One example would be this governance of the relief uh, management this time. Um, uh, if there were, I mean, uh, the, the the bureaucracy, if they had a good connection with the local community, they could have, they could have counter, the the takeover by the local political machine, and they could, uh, because, uh, uh, interestingly or unfortunately, the the connection, the the synergy, the de facto synergy that we had have in Bangladesh with the local community. Uh, 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 is, is, is between the local community and the local political elites. They trust the local political elites much more than anyone else. And they were given numbers to complain, okay? Hot numbers, no one used it because they know this, you know, impersonal state out there, who cares? I mean, they're not going to help us. At the end of the day, this person, my member, uh, uh, our chairman of the union Parisha, that person is going to help us, either formally or informally because that person has also stake in terms as their political leader and so on, you know, preserving their social capital and political reputation and so on. So people do understand that. So the synergy that we are talking about in terms of, you know, um, uh, sorry, I forgot the term, what was it again? Um, Naomi, the term that you Anti-fragile. So Anti-fragility. So anti-fragility, uh, anti-fragile institution would be one. One example would be if the, if the, the local bureaucracy, the state agency, have this kind of you know very organic, 
trustful relationship with the community, where community, when facing this kind of crisis, can genuinely uh, uh, rely on the on the on the on the, uh, the local bureaucracy. So that kind of administrative uh, reorganization, where the the, where the 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 distinction between community and the administration will be blurred, and there'll be reciprocal relationship and so on. Uh, so that, that's one example of anti-fragility. There are more, but that's one. And you know, constrained innovation, constant learning, um, uh, all sides of the, the, I mean, even one size fits all, that's a no-no in anti-fragility and so on. This is, at this, at this moment, given the Bangladesh political governance is probably a, a fantasy, but yeah, but worth you know, having as a vision. Thank you. And the final question question is from Satya Dash. Um, so two parts, what are the political implications of COVID-19 management? And then he also asks, what was the budget for COVID management audited and any scope of corruption? So, I mean, did basically did the money get to where it, it, it should have been going? I would say about the, the better management of the COVID pandemic, I mean, on what basis are we judging this? Currently, it's I think it's still very, very hard to say. I mean, there are some disastrous cases, Brazil, Uruguay, and there are some better cases, New Zealand, but, you know, South Korea. It's very, very hard to say, you know, the, every country is so different, which one has done better and how politics has shaped with that. We've tried, we've tried to show, you know, in particular, the dominance of the political dominance and how that's played out in COVID management. But I, 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 you know, I don't know that I'd say they definitely did do better. It's not over yet, you know? That's one of the things to keep in mind. It's definitely not over for Bangladesh till we get vaccinated. Um, on this COVID procurement scrutiny issue, I think this is a very key issue. And uh, last time I looked at it, I saw something like, is it, I can't remember how many billion, I think it's $1.5 billion of loans have been given by um, ADB, World Bank, and I want to say AAIB, the Asian Infrastructural Bank, um, for COVID-related programming. And this is, this is a lot of money. This is a lot of money. And it's been pushed through at a time when essentially the World Bank's citizen engagement and other monitoring uh, systems are not really able to, I think, to cope with. They've just in established all of these new monitoring mechanisms in the World Bank or participation mechanisms in the World Bank. They're not, I would, I would strongly suggest, working as well as they might. And... Um, I think that procurement, COVID procurement is going to turn out to be a huge issue in Bangladesh as it has elsewhere. We're looking right now at the, at the vaccine uh, issues and also at the, um, some of the testing, uh, COVID testing and procurement issues around that. It's, it's pretty murky. Lots of people in Bangladesh as elsewhere, it seems, have looked at this as an opportunity to make large amounts of money, given that it's very hard to scrutinize what goes on. This is this is a big issue. I don't know the facts. I'm just saying we don't we don't know, but we we think it's very likely these will be big issues um, in terms of corruption and so on. But it's a bit dangerous to say anything when you when you find it hard to, to show the proof um, because of the the opaqueness of it all. Is that right? No, I don't have much to add. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you again to our speakers, to our discussants. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.